This is a great place to be. And it's a great place to be since people who come to places like these mean, mean to glorify the Lord of heaven. That, that's our purpose. I was helped by the balance in our brother's prayer. And the songs we just sang work in very well with some of the things I hope uh, to say. Um, um, if you took a watch, if you took a watch to some isolated part of the world, wherever that might be, to very intelligent people, very gifted people, but people who know nothing about timepieces. They don't have any use for them. They don't know what they are. And you gave it to them. They might be able to examine it, open up the back, check out the spindles, the little springs, the cogs. They could maybe, if they were metallurgists, tell you what this cheap watch is made of, and they would know how the cogs fit and move all the hands, all of that stuff. They could describe it flawlessly. Ooh. But if they didn't know what it was for, then they, they don't know what it is. If they don't know what it is, they don't know what it's for. And they would look at it in perfect description. But they wouldn't know how it functions. Even though they could describe it all. Biblically. Ooh, I was going to look at my watch I had up my hand. How's that for you? Hey? Isn't that good? Um... That's how scriptures work. There's all the difference in the world between doing exegesis, doing syntactical studies, uh, doing lexical work, doing historical background and all of that, and describing the verses, describing them, flawlessly saying how the verb connects with the object and all of that, and still not know how the text is functioning. We said last night something about Luke 3, 1 to 6, and those seven named people, 15 year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, da 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 But if you don't know what Luke is doing with those verses, all you do is repeat what he says. Oh, well, then that's what he says, and now let's go on to the next verse. No, no, that ooh, is going to sound rude. I don't mean it to sound rude. That's not good Bible study. We need to know not only what the texts say and how the texts hang together grammatically and lexically. We need to know what the writer means to do with them. Hmm. Yes? That makes sense to me. Our lesson this evening is something about Jesus against the powers. But it's supposed to be a gospel message, don't you see? And I tell you what I don't like about my own communicating if I do it and when I do it, I'm not interested in offering you information. End of story. Whatever is offered has to be put in a context of the whole story. It has to be gospeling. Or we're not doing here, this or any other evening, what we purpose to do. First... Always first, ceaselessly first. Before we tell our friends or our enemies what they must do and should do. First, always first, ceaselessly first. 
We've got to tell what God did and is doing and will bring to a completion. That is gospel. Before a single word of the New Testament was written, there were people gospeling. Twelve fellows got up, Acts 2, and they started talking about, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, of which you are all witnesses. Him being, and you know how that text was on, you killed him by lawless hands, and nomia is the word, Gentiles is what he has in mind. You by wicked hands have crucified and slain him, and then, whom God raised up. Hmm. He goes on to say, why? Because it wasn't possible for death to hold him. He doesn't say why it wasn't possible for death to hold him. But we can think of a dozen reasons, can't we? For God said to him on Sunday morning, time to get up. And he got up and death couldn't hold him. But there are other big, rich reasons. First, always first, ceaselessly first, we need the gospel. And then we'll tell our friends and our family, we'll tell our brothers and sisters in the Christ, we will tell our enemies, we'll tell whoever, won't we? And that was the part of the prayer, don't you see? That we come to know him. Jesus draws ever near you. So we get to know him. And what did he say? And I, they said, we'll kill you and that'll put an end to you. And what did he say? And I, if I, <laughs> isn't it a great story? And I, if I be lifted up, he said, I will draw all kinds of, everywhere, people will be drawn to me. They tried to end them and they thought they would end them by killing him. They didn't know it, but that was his way to glory. Now, what's this business about Jesus and the powers? What we characteristically do, and I'm not angry about it, it's, it's a good thing. What we characteristically do when we talk about the gospel, we say, Christ died for my sins and I give forgiveness so I can go to heaven. See, that's a good thing. Thank God it's not only true, it's a central issue for you and me. But it isn't big enough. It's essential. We, we thank God for it and should thank God for it. When we break the bread and drink the wine on Sundays, we say to him over and over again, and it's good that we say over and over again, Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for bearing our sins. Thank you that in your blood our sins are washed away. All of that. We should say. We shouldn't say less than that. But we should say more than that. For the gospel is bigger than my personal experience of God. Bigger than yours. The gospel is bigger than the truth that in the Lord Jesus Christ you'll find forgiveness. And if there's someone here who has not yet given their lives to the Christ and you've been thinking about it and that's why you've been here, you've heard your father, your mother, your school teacher, Sunday school teacher, whoever it is, your friends talking to you about Christ and you've been thinking about it and you're here this evening. Mm. Well, you to do and there are people here who will help you speak to you about how in the New Testament people gave their lives to Christ were embraced in his love and given not only forgiveness but a destiny and a mission yes so what's this about Christ 
and the powers. It's important for you and me, and this is not a Bible study where you can say to me, explain that. You, you, you can't stop me right now. That's the point. But in a Bible class, you could put your hand up and we could talk about it. And then we could have another Bible class and we could do it again and again. Here, all you have to do is sit and listen to me. But do hear this, please. We have to make up our mind to what the Bible teaches about sin. Sin is not, here I am, I'm a creature of free choice, I'm offered a choice between good and evil, and I choose the evil, I've sinned. I use some speech that's not good, I've done that. I think some evil thoughts, I practice some evil, this, that, and the other, and I personally have sinned. It's that sin. It's bigger than that. Sin didn't start with me. There were sinners in the world before I got here. And sin won't end with me either. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes, pulls the curtain down and all of this, I have affected people, hurt their hearts. I've given them bad um, instruction. I've, I've modeled things badly for them and I've helped shape. Done it with my own children, haven't I? Because I'm a sinner. But I too was shaped. I too was born just pure as a, an innocent child was born. But it wasn't long before. I know how it was to be selfish. Well, where did I get that from? Well, it didn't grow up as a root. I, I'm not a reformed believer. I, 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 I don't mean to be blunt. If you happen to be a Calvinist here, I, you weren't invited for me to be ugly to you. I'm not a Calvinist. I can't go that right at all. I was born not holy, but innocent. I wasn't righteous. I hadn't made any choices, but I came from God and I was born all right. But by and by, because I was born into a world, a world of wickedness. By and by, I saw and heard things. By and by, somebody made me mad. By and by, somebody hurt me and on and on and on. The point I want to make is that though I'm an individual sinner and responsible before God, I'm only one of jillions of us. After Adam and Eve, the world was never the same. Sin, like a plague, ran through the world like a fire in a paint factory. People helped people to be ugly. Societies were structured People were born into wicked societies and learned to be evil and to do evil and and at times to rejoice in evil. Some of you sitting here don't know much about that, but you do know you're sinners and you do know you have sinned and you do know that you need forgiveness. All that's true, but some of you were good girls who were raised in a lovely home, a God-loving home, a Christ-serving home, and you were raised carefully. And while you were a sinner, you were a good girl and you became a great woman. Some of you were good men, or well, good boys, who have become good men. And you never got out there in the wiles of wickedness as some of us have done. But nevertheless, put this across all of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And none of us, by the Christ himself, None of us is getting into this world coming to any kind of sense of adulthood without our sinning. Why is that? Because sin, biblically, is not just sinful choices. Hear Paul in Romans 5, 6, and 7. When he talks about sin, he talks about sin as a king, that's a metaphor. He doesn't mean that sin is an actual person, but he personifies sin. And he says this of sin, that sin, Romans 5, sin reigned through death. What was the mark, says Paul, in the world from Adam and Eve on, that sin had power and was reigning in the world? People were dying all over the place. Death for you and me who were in the know. 
Death is not just biological cessation. Death is not just biologically ending. It is a mark on the human family that is alienated from God. When people die, of course they've died physically, but it says more than that. It's a mark that humans, the human family, has been alienated from God. Sin reigns through death, says Paul in Romans 5. That's 12 to 21. Look, look, we can't read these texts. You know that. We don't have the time for it. You don't have the time for it. I could talk a a long time, of course, but you don't have the time for it. But you must read the text for yourself. Romans 5, 12 to the end, he tells us that sin reigns through death. In chapter 6, he talks about sin as a slave. And and another place in the New Testament. He talks about sin as a slave owner. People are enslaved to sin. Now there isn't a person sin. It's, It's a metaphor again. It's a personification of this power. This power that enslaves not just me or you, but us. The entire human family. He speaks also in Romans chapter 6 and 7 of sin being a law giver. Sin took the holy Torah, says Paul in Romans 7. He took the holy Torah, the law of God, the Old Testament law of God, perverted it and used it to slay people. God meant it for life. But Paul will say, sin, taken advantage of me, seduced me, and took the law, and by the Torah, the holy, righteous, spiritual, always good, holy law, slew me. And so what did the Torah then become? It became what Paul calls a Torah of sin and death. So what what am I saying here? Let me summarize what I've said to this point. I'm saying that when you and I talk about sin, we need to talk about something bigger, something vaster, something that encompasses the entire human family. It's a power that you and I and each of us as humans, by and by, fell to. So, when Jesus comes to take care of sin, listen, listen. When Jesus comes to deal with sin, he's not coming just to deal with your personal sin, though he does that. He comes to deal with the moral smog that envelops the planet. Picture our planet. Picture a cloud of moral muck that's just suffocating the people in it. Children are born into it and they start breathing that atmosphere and by and by they become sick with this contamination and they start spewing up their own personal configurations of sin and filling the air with all of that. When Jesus came to deal with sin, he didn't come to deal just with my personal wrongs and yours. He came to deal with that that contaminates everyone. And he deals with all of it. There is no sin that he hasn't dealt with. Of course, if you don't want it dealt with, then you don't get it dealt with. Those who don't want him, and I don't find any joy in this, and neither do you, Those who do not want him and don't want to be forgiven, they don't get it. But the point is, Jesus has dealt with the sin that is the problem. So what should you and I be saying about sin when we read scripture? Of course, it affects us personally and should. But the Bible is bigger than your wrong or mine. 
When the Bible talks about sin, it talks about this massive power, this, these structures, these evils that contaminate the planet. Hmm. Moving then from that to this. How does this come about? How does it come about that, that sin is so, um, so strong against us? Because society structures it. The powers, governments, leaders, those who speak. It's the talkers that rule the world to a great degree. These people speak it. Uh, corrupt governments. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Four kingdoms from Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. They became corrupt. And all the governments that came, came to be corrupt... They had the power. And they laid down the laws. They told people where to stand, where to sit, what to eat, what to drink, what taxes to pay, on and on and on. And when children in ancient Egypt went to school and said, uh, how does it come when you throw seed in the ground um, that crops come up? Nobody talked botany. Nobody talked agriculture. They told them stories about the gods. How, how does it come that the river Nile is so filled with fish and it's able to feed us and all of these things? When they asked these questions, nobody talked about animal life and such. They talked about Osiris, the god of the river. How does it come that the sun goes down and the moon comes up? There were stories about Amon Ra and Thoth. What about, well, look at the wilderness out there. Once you get beyond the green belt, it's all wilderness. How does it come? And they were told stories about Sekhmet. On and on and on. It was the gods that these people taught. They'd, they'd been corrupted. And they had become polytheists and idolaters and the like. And they taught it to all the children and all the families. And this, these stories, they're being told all the time. Aren't they? And God wasn't mad at the people. Well, that's an overstatement. I go to the hospital. I have cancer, a tumor. The good doctor wants, the good surgeon wants to help me with it. He doesn't perform an operation on the bench. If he wants to deal with the tumor, he has to work on me. And if God wants to deal with my personal sin, he doesn't deal with the pew, he has to deal with me. And so when God deals with sin, he deals with people. But these stories are what God was mad at. And you know this from the Old Testament. That the scriptures in Exodus tell us and the Psalms are filled with it, that God was mad at the gods. And he just dismantled them all. He took all those gods and made idiots of them. They could do nothing, they were nothing, and he showed that he was the Lord God. He took a corrupt government that was corrupting everybody around it. And here's what I'm wanting to get to, and if I don't hurry up and get to it, we'll be here all night. I'm wanting to get to this. It is kingdoms and governments. It is local governments. It is bigger governments. It is national and international. It is wars and rumors of wars where the whole world is sick in kingdoms which God established to do good have become corrupt. And all of we who live under the laws, even in a democracy, we are corrupted also. I don't mean to be rude. I know that Americans are very patriotic. But you know better than to think that America is free of wickedness. The United Kingdom is ugly. China is ugly. The whole empire, these empire structures. I don't mean every person in every nation. It's just not true. When God brings down empires in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, he's bringing down a structure. There are still a rocky people bound to the Babylonian ancients. They're still alive and well. And not every man, woman, boy and girl over in those foreign countries are all bad like some of the people. We lose the tyrants. Of course, they live under the 
pressure of them. But here's what I want to say. That God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, created the powers, Romans 13, 1-5, let every person, every soul, let every person be subject to the higher powers, governmental powers, because there are no powers but that be of God. And he goes on to say that there is ministers. Yes, but when they don't minister the creation goods, and that's what he intends them to do, then he holds them responsible for it. And if they get bad enough, he brings them down. God is against the kingdoms. Daniel chapter, what's this got to do with gospel? Everything. Everything. Your gospel is bigger than I get forgiveness and when I die I can go to heaven. It's bigger than that. It's not less than that. It's bigger than that. Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's not just the head of the church. His name is above every name, not only in this world, but in the world to come. He went up into heaven, says Peter, and the angels and principalities were made subject of him. Twice in Revelation, when it goes against Rome, we're told he's the king of kings and lord of lords. The book is hardly open, but we're told, chapter 1, that he's the prince of the kings of the earth. What's all that about? Why, why does he have to talk about all those kingdoms and powers? Because they have become corrupt. And they shape the world. It's the people who have the power whose word. You pay taxes. And the money is used for stuff that you have absolutely no favor for. We are all hauled into producing wickedness one way or another. And this is true of any country you name. And in our world, it's so corrupt now, you can't get I, you're making mistakes every time you turn around. Um, the sweat shops in India and in uh, those far places, uh, people lining up outside hoping that someone inside will get sick, not be able to work, and they will get in and get a job. What do we do? We in the West go to some of these clothes shops and say, you buy your clothes from the sweatshops over in the Philippines and over in Thailand and the like. We're going to boycott you. So we boycott those shops and they stop getting the stuff made in these countries. And people over there are begging to get in and work for a dollar a week. Huh? Everywhere you go, the whole thing is all messed up. The one who handles it, handles the whole thing. And only he can work it out. But the good news is, he does work it out. And he gives us some illustrations of the truth that he does that. Daniel 2, head of gold, silver, chest, copper, thighs, and stomach, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Yes? There's a mountain. There's a big rock cut out of it. The statue stands four kingdoms. They all stand. They're not four statues. They're one. Because they all have the same heart. They all have the same purpose. They're all anti-God, anti-holiness, anti-life. And they're all abusive. And the rock is cut out of the mountain without hands. Hits this statue on the legs and the feet. And it's at that point that all four are pulverized and the wind carries the dust away. What's that got to do with gospeling. It's the word that God is against the powers that help corrupt us. We corrupt the government, and the government corrupts, corrupts us, and we shape one another in evil. And God is opposed to all of that. In chapter 7 of Daniel, same kingdoms. They're told to be four beasts coming up out of the water. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Daniel 2 had said in the dead, 44, Daniel 2. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. 
that will not be destroyed. He doesn't say, in the death of those kings, he will forgive you your personal sins. It's involved. That's in it. But that's not what he says. Jesus didn't come into the world simply to deal with my sin. Ah! He wanted to bless the world. The entire human family. And he's opposed to anything and everything that demeans and dishonors and cheapens you and me and helps us to cheapen one another and abuse one another. And what he means to do is to establish a kingdom which he's already done. And it's already the, the mark, the mark that he's already done it is the presence of Christians here this very evening. You need to know this. This is gospel, let me tell you. You need to know you're not just a, a, a forgiven person. You are that if you're in Christ. Never mind the debates about it. If you're in Christ, you're forgiven for pity's sake. But you're more than that. You're part of a kingdom. You're a kingdom of priests. You're a holy nation. You were called out of darkness into his marvelous light to declare the excellencies of the glories of him who did just that. And your business is to keep the story alive in every generation. That Christ did all that needed to be done in his personal body in the first century. But he went away, then came back in and as the Holy Spirit, and he indwells the body of Christ. And it's the indwelling of the Spirit of Jesus that constitutes Christians as the body of Christ. And your business and mine is to keep the story alive. We do it with our singing. We do it in our prayers. We do it in our reading. We do it in our physical gathering. We do it in our contributing our money each week, which Paul argues in uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, that our giving is more than dropping your dollar or your denarius on a plate. It's one of the marks that God has been in the world in Jesus Christ, reconciling the world himself, Jew and Gentile. You know that that offering in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 was for Jews. Gentiles and Jews hated one another. Christ came into the world, get into the hearts of people, and Gentiles were now sending money to help those Jews that hated their guts all along. And Paul says that's one of the markers that God's been in the world in Jesus. And when you give your money, drop it in the plate, what do we do? We take ten, I don't mean to be rude here. We take ten seconds to say, let's get ready to give. It would take five minutes to pick it up. It's the last thing we hear about it till next week. Oh, that's very sad. If she puts in a dollar, if he puts in five, if they put in ten, whatever it is they put in, they need to know that dropping that money in the plate may not look like a whole lot. But this is one of the marks that God has been in the world and taking kingdoms, demolishing all the wickedness and drawing them together into the body of Christ. In any case, in the book of Daniel chapter 7, they come up out of the water, those four same kingdoms. And we have a picture of the Son of Man going to heaven, getting the kingdom. And the animal, beast, the best of kingdoms are destroyed. Christ is against the powers. In Colossians 1.15, it's nearly quarter to eight. You thought it was 9.30, didn't you? No. But, but I'm nearly done, and you're doing very well. In Colossians chapter 1, 15 and 16, he says this. Of Jesus, he said, He's the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. And it goes on to say that in him all things were created. Things in heaven, things in earth. All the powers were created by God through Jesus. Who? Who? 
All the powers were created by him, yes. And what happened then? They became corrupt. The world spirit entered and the kingdoms, the leaders that he set up, they all became corrupt with the corruption that Adam and Eve became corrupt with. And, and wickedness and, and spite and greed, all of those things spread throughout the world. And those who had the power, they saw it all, made sure it all went on. But God made them. That's the point. And in John chapter 1, what? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The word, and Word what God. All things were created by Him. And there was nothing created that He didn't create. So, it was all done right. And then somebody whispered. And you say it with a hiss. You say, like a snake. Whispered things. And we bought into all that nonsense. And our leaders bought into all of it. Hmm. So they were shanghai And Colossians 2, 15 tells us this. Speaking of God, 2, 15. It says, and he disarmed the powers. Disarmed them. There's a funny Greek word there rendered disarmed. Maybe this arm's all right. But it's a word, apeptusamenos. It means, it's a compound thing. It means to strip off and away. I like the picture of a lot of dogs jumping on a big bear. And the big bear stripping them off and flinging them away. Whatever we ought to, however we ought to translate the term. God disarmed the powers. Triumphing over them. He makes a spectacle of them. And Paul's story is this. That when Rome put Jesus on the cross, following N.T. Wright's remark, when, when Rome put Jesus on the cross, if indeed they stripped him of his clothes, we don't know as much about crucifixion as we say we do. If they stripped him off of his clothes, they certainly stripped him of his rights. They made a spectacle of him. And they said, we triumphed over him. And they didn't know. But in that very act of putting him up there and doing all of that to him, God was doing it to them. Isn't isn't that a marvelous truth? I mean, I know know other people who think, "Ah, those Christians, they talk a load of nonsense. Do we, though? Where is Tiberius IX, that poor idiot? Where, where, where is Caligula? Where is Nero who, who died saying, oh, what a tragedy it is that such an artist has to die? Where, where are all those guys? Where is ancient Assyria IX? Where are all those kings? Where is Stalin and Hitler and all those boys? Where is Pol Pot? Where is Papa Doc? Name the list. Get the list of all the, oh, the serious tyrants. Where are they all? Yesterday morning, I think, uh, I mentioned, I should have mentioned, I said 37, 38, I should have said 36, 37 of Isaiah. We have Rob Shekau, who was the, uh, the, foreign, the war secretary, telling uh, Jerusalem, we're going to bring you down. Speaking against, where, where, where's the Syria now? Big old city. 200 towers, they tell us it had. Walls, three chariots wide. What? Fierce warriors. Guys checking out the foundations of Jerusalem. It's coming down. Is it though? Uh, where are they now? All gone. In one night, 185,000 Assyrians said, No! No freedom! And in the night, God whispered, 185,000. Yes, it is. Yeah, freedom for them. And they were all gone. Where are all these kingdoms? They're gone. And all the rest will go. But here's the point. Here's here's the good news in all of this good news. God never eternally, never intended to save a bunch of individuals. That's not what he intended. He always intended a human family 
in glory, immortal, free from sin, free from ungodliness, loving righteous, loving to do what is right. You've done this. I know you have. Haven't you done something? Oh, I'm nearly done. I'm nearly, I'm nearly finished. Haven't, haven't you at some point in your life done something lovely? I mean, just, just something really sweet. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to talk about it to everybody, but every now and again you bring it out and you think, I don't care who did that, me or anybody else, that was a lovely thing to do. Yeah. And, and it's lovely to do that. I, I've done a couple of those things in 75 years. Just, just to bring it out, take a look at it, and here's what you think. Oh, that's a lovely thing. If I did it once, maybe, maybe I could do it again. Because I love having done it. You know what I mean. You've done this. There's a day coming. When we'll awake. And the first thing we'll want to do. I want to do something good. Just the joy of it. Homemade ice cream. Mouthful of that. Oh, not brilliant. We're going to enjoy doing what is good. As we would enjoy a lovely meal. Or, or some of our favorite ways of behaving. All of this will be part of a kingdom. A nation. A holy human family. A single big family. A life. Brim full of life. And joy. All working together. All living in the image of God. The whole reality being what God eternally purposed to make. Oh, love that story. I was talking one time at one building, and I get on like that. I, 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 I never mean to get noisy. I can't not do it. That's all there is about it. And uh, a, a lady was sitting about ten pews back, and she went, you know, like that. Oh, holding her head. <laughs> I thought to myself as I was talking, it's amazing what you think when you're talking. You see things going on and you start thinking things while you're talking. But I thought, oh dear, I've given that poor woman a headache. Uh, so after it was all over, I made a beeline for her. I said, my dear, I'm very sorry that I got that light and hurt your head. She said, oh, she said, no, I just have migraines. Well, I wouldn't want to argue about her medical condition, you understand? <laughs> but I think I triggered it. That's my point. But, but, but look, but look, look. Our story is too good to keep to ourselves. I, I'm not trying to bully you into saying anything. He'll get a hold of you. And you'll love the notion of being held. You'll love the idea of God getting a hold of your heart and you and I will start talking to one another, to our fathers and mothers, our brothers and sisters. We'll talk to each other. We'll start talking gospel. We'll end up, some of you women will end up under those things in the hairdressers, and you'll be talking to the lady that's doing your job. Well, what do you think about it? And here you will be going on and on about it. This is who we are for pity's sake. But the thing is, it is Christ's work against the gods, against the powers that you and I stand for. Sunday mornings, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the section about the supper, the Eucharistic meal. Paul says, when we eat and drink, he doesn't say it this way, but he says it. When we eat and drink, we're against the gods. We have nothing to do with demons. We say no to demons. We say no to the gods. We participate with one another at the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's Christ against the gods. And does he win? He's already won. It's all over. Last thing I want to say to you, and then we'll sing a hymn, and if we can help you in some way, let us do it. Let's all of us do something about our life in Christ this very night. Yes? Well, Tennyson tells of um, King Arthur, the round table, 
No corners, no head, no tail, nothing like that. A round table. Everybody's equal. And he wanted to establish a thing called Camelot. Where everybody did what was right. It was might for right. Justice for all. Oh, great idea. And the knights came from all over Europe and where else. And they sat around the table. And it started working. Worked well. And it just when it got where women could go out at night and walk the roads and not worry at all about anything. When people didn't have to lock their doors. When everything was going marvelously. Lancelot eyed Guinevere. And Guinevere eyed Lancelot. Things fell apart. They're going to try her. They're going to kill her for being uh, uh, treasonous. Lancelot won't have it. He comes, gets her, carries her off to France. She goes to a convent and war has to be declared. And so instead of all what there was, then vengefulness became the danger. King Arthur is in France. He's getting himself ready in, in the early evening time for the battle early the next morning. He hears a rustle in the bushes. Who's that? A little boy comes out, 12 years old, something like. He said, what are you doing here? How would you get here? He said, I stowed away on the, one of the boats. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I've come to kill the enemy. He said, what have you get killed? He said, well, I do, I do, but I've come to kill the enemy. He said, what's all that about? He said, well, I want to be a knight. A knight? And Arthur's all, you know, he's down in the mouth about it all. What he's going to do, likes Lancelot and hates all that has happened. Thinks the whole enterprise has failed. And he said, uh, a knight? Why would you ever want to be a knight? He said, was your father a knight? No. Was your mother ever saved by a knight? No. Well, what do you know about them? Nothing other than the stories that they tell. Stories. He says, what story? And the boy starts to rehearse, you know, knights of the round table, justice for all, might for right. And as the boy is saying it, the king is mouthing it. He said, who are you? He said, I'm Tom of Warwick. He said, get down there. He gives him the needle and he dubs him Sir Tom of Warwick. And he said, now you get up, go behind the lines, get home safe and sound. And... Uh, Every evening from December to December, before you fall asleep upon your cot, think of all the tales that you remember of Camelot. Ask everyone if he has heard the story. And tell it loud and clear if he is not. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one bright, shining moment that was known as Camelot. And the kid, he started singing it. And then his aide says, Your Majesty, we need to get ready for the battle. He said, The battle's already been taken care of. He said, We've already won the battle. Whatever happens after this is irrelevant. The story is going to live on. If Jesus walked in the door this minute, he would say to you who belong to him, I'm depending on you. You and I are in this together. We're against the gods. We're against the kingdoms and the powers that have corrupted the world and corrupted themselves. And you are a peculiar people. Tell the story. Gospel. Gospel to your children. Sing to them at nights. Tell them the stories of scriptures. Tell it to your husbands and wives. Tell it to one another. Talk the story. Tell it to the milkman. Tell it to whoever. When the opportunity arises, however nervous you are, just say, God bless you, or something. And, oh, you know, say something. Story. Do it in your own way. I'll do it in mine. We'll all do it together. Yes? Yes, we will. God bless you, and if we can help you, let us help you while we stand and sing.